All right, so this is, uh, again, fixed income. Fixed income. And if I remember, this is lecture number six. I've been looking up to the point of, uh, let me see where we were on the chapter two. Comparable yield, required yield, zero coupon. Okay, we were at the point of complications. And complications is on page 27, uh, which the way I looked at it said, uh, no need to cover, we'll just skip complications and move to section four. So, chapter two, section four, and section four is called pricing floating rate and inverse floating rate securities. We call these, for short, floaters. And that's on page 29. All right, so we begin with a floater. And floater simply stands short for a floating rate security. And we already have floating rate security is kind of like the same as adjustable rate, as flexible rate. It's got a number of components. The first basic component is the spread. And the second basic component is, uh, oh, second basic component was the benchmark. So the benchmark is the interest rate which we peg the current security, the floater. So the floating interest rate will have a benchmark interest rate like LIBOR which will be moving up and down. It's going to be usually market determined and then the spread will be fixed, 3%, 4%, 5% is going to be the spread. So every floater has got a benchmark, it's got a spread, and the coupon on the floater is the sum of the benchmark and the spread. Usually, but not always, a floater we have a cap. And cap is the maximum interest rate which a floating rate security pays. It's just a number. They're just going to say the cap is 10%. So it may be floating up and down, up and down, but as soon as it hits 10, it never goes 10 and a half, 11 and higher. It stays at 10 until, for some reason, meaning for the reason that benchmark falls, that the actual interest rate falls below the cap. So. You always compute it as the spread plus the benchmark, and if the number is higher than the cap, let's say higher than 10%, you just use the cap of 10%. That's the cap. And usually, it will also have a floor. And a floor is usually the minimum interest rate which the security will pay. So they're just going to say, okay, it's adjustable, but will never fall below 4% or 5% or 3%. So on the cap is basically a protection for the borrower because for some reason interest rates can shoot sky high 16, 20, 22%. The borrower might not be able to pay 22%, but if the cap says 10, he knows that the maximum he'll ever be paying is 10. Well, the floor is a protection for the investor. For some reason, like we are currently experiencing right now, treasuries, short-term treasuries yield the astonishing 0%, like nothing. 
10-year Treasury yields yield barely 2%. And these are historically low, as low you know, for the last 30, 40, 50, or 60 years. Interest rates have never been as low as they are today. 10-year Treasury pays 2%. Well, if that's the case, the floor, for example, if the floor is 5%, and the margin is, or the spread is, let's say, 2%. With a two benchmark and a two spread, the security would pay four, but the floor might be saying five. This means the investor is guaranteed at least five, no matter what. Okay? That's cap, that's the floor. Okay. The next, which is actually a uh, very tricky and difficult uh, to understand that actually most people don't. Uh, it took me a while to figure it out when I was reading it a long time ago. It's called inverse flow term. And inverse flow term means that the coupon rate goes up when the benchmark goes down and the other way around. So, as interest rates rise, you pay less. As interest rates fall, you pay more. Now the question is why would anyone devise an inverse floater that moves in the exactly opposite direction, moves mirror-wise to the interest rates, and the answer is very simple. Hedging. Uh, if you have already exposure to a floater, when you add up to it an inverse floater, as the one goes up, the other one goes down, and then in the opposite direction. So they cancel each other out. So what you have is a floater and an inverse floater when you put them together, they act as a fixed interest rate security, okay? And that's actually exactly how the design inverse folder is designed. And I'm going to be now explaining page 30, if you have the textbook, exhibit 2-4. You have one giant fixed income security and a fixed income security I will use a slightly different trick for me it's much easier to understand that way it's going to be you put together two bonds and two bonds will have a face value of 2000 and out of it you create artificially a floater and an inverse floater. So this is fixed. This one is floater. And this one is inverse floater. And here is a definition. The definition of inverse floater this inverse floater is defined that's what we call it is simply defined as fixed interest rate minus floater minus floater. And now let's provide simplified example. If I put in this to be 2,000, I can put in here any kind of principle, 500 and 1,500, but the easiest way is to make these two equal. And we make this to be 1,000 of principle, and this one will be also 1,000 of principle. So, out of 2,000 of fixed income security, which is paying, I don't know, 5%, you get one floater with 1,000 and another inverse floater with 1,000. 
And now here's the trick about interest. Suppose the fixed is paying 5%. If the fixed is paying 5%, on 2,000, the equivalent will be like 10%. So here's the trick. We're going to make this floater to be, uh, the floater will be benchmark. Floater will be simply benchmark. And this one will be 10 minus benchmark. And here is the example that will illustrate for you to understand. Floater paying 5, inverse paying 5. Floater paying 6, the inverse will be paying 4. The floater paying 7, this one will be paying 3. Floater paying 8, this one will be paying 2. Floater paying 9, this one's going to be 1. Floater paying 10, this has got to be 0. Now, can the floater be paying 11? The answer is theoretically yes, but in practice you're going to put a cap on the floater at 10, which is double the fixed. Okay. So the cap on the floater will be 10, and the floor on the inverse floater will be 0. So as the floater goes up from 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to 10, the inverse floater will be going down. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay. And the opposite. If the floater falls down, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, the inverse floater will be going 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And both of them will be a cap of 10, never rising above 10. And both of them will be ha having a floor of 0, never falling below 0. And both of them, when you add them up, will add up always to 10. 5 plus 5, 6 plus 4, 8 plus 2, 9 plus 1. They will always add up. And that's how inverse floater is constructed. Because the way it's constructed, you and that's the definition, inverse floater is simply two separate instruments, one minus the other. The value of the inverse floater, so you say value of inverse floater, is by definition of additivity which I explained last time, will be simply the value of the fixed interest rate minus the value of the floater. So, inverse floaters, you don't want to evaluate them like in some fancy way. All you got to do is have value of the fixed interest rate, which is amazingly simple. Every little calculator has it. And then value the floater itself. So, valuation of inverse floaters essentially boils down to figuring out how to value a floater. All right. So the question is, now how do we value a floater? Interestingly enough, the floaters are counterintuitive, but the best way to understand a floater is that if the spread remains more or less the same, spread, sometimes they, in the textbook they call it also margin. If the spread remains the same and unchanged, the price will remain unchanged. And let me try to explain more. For example, the spread is 3%. It is fixed. At the creation of the security, it is 3% over the benchmark. So, until the life of the security, it is always 3%. Now, if the required spread on the market, which compensates for risk, like credit risk, liquidity, and all the other risk, is 3%, then the floater will be selling at par. For example, uh, yield will be 7%, which is going to be 4% for the 
benchmark plus 3% for the spread. So yield 7% is what it will be yielding. If the required yield is 7, so you require 7, it pays 7, then the price will be 1,000. In other words, if the required yield equals the coupon, then the security. Every bond sells at par. It's not selling at discount. It's not selling at a premium. It sells at par. Well, if the benchmark now increases to 5%, but here is the key, the spread. The required spread doesn't change, meaning the risk of the security doesn't change. The security will be paying three again. The new required yield will be eight, and the coupon will be eight. And therefore, the new price will be again 1,000. So as the required yield increases by 1%, the coupon increases by 1%, and the price remains unchanged. And if the required yield falls by 2%, the coupon falls by 2%, and the price remains unchanged. So the security, sorry, the price of a floater remains constant as long as the spread doesn't change. Now, the, cha the, the spread never changes. It is fixed up front, let's say 3%. And if risk doesn't change, and risk aversion doesn't change, and the required spread doesn't change, then the price remains constant. And it is that simple. And for some reason, if perceived risk increases, and investors get a little scared for whatever reason. They say, oh, maybe the chance or the likelihood of bankruptcy or credit default goes higher. Then the required spread increases to four. Then the price must fall to compensate for the 1% change or 1% increase in the required spread. So the pricing is decomposed by the benchmark and by the required spread. And because the spread is always fixed for the security of three, if the required spread goes up, <coughs> price goes down. And if the required spread goes down, price goes up. Usually, required spread varies very little over the life of security. If the credit default risk and liquidity risk, in other words, if the risk of the security doesn't change much. All right, is that fairly clear? Any questions here? No? Questions? Okay, so, and that's it. Now, uh, this particular security, in this particular case, we took two fixed income bonds out of which you construct a floater and an inverse floater has a special name. It's called collateral. Collateral. In other words, an investment bank will create a floater, will create an inverse floater, will sell it to people and say, do you want a floater or do you want inverse floater? He says, I buy the flo floater. The other guy says, I'm by the inverse floater. So you got the one security, you got the other security, you know you're safe because the investment bank will have two bonds, fixed interest rate bonds. Use this collateral backing both your bond and your bond, okay? So you create these two, they are backed underneath by these two. And these two are used as collateral. If anything goes wrong here, you can use these two bonds to cover these. Okay? And by definition, the sum will be always identical. This and this must always equal this one. That's because that's how you define the inverse water. Okay? 
Okay. All right, that's it. Uh, price quotes and accrued interest. That's section five. Let's go with this here. Let's go with this here. Section five, that's chapter two, five. Two, five is price quotes. Uh, that will be page 31. Page 31. Well, the first fundamental concept is accrued interest. Accrued. So what is accrued interest? Which is this is interest which has already been earned since the last payment of interest, since the last coupon payment. The example will be, for example, coupon is paid January 1 and then it's paid July 1. Well, right now, today is September 28th. So since the last coupon, you have July, August, and let's just say full September, okay, 28th, September. So you have six month coupon, three months already passed, and three months still to go. This basically means that you have already earned half of the coupon. So, if the annual coupon is, I'm just providing a simple example, if the annual coupon is 8%, how much is the semi-annual, how much is the semi-annual coupon payment? How many dollars? How many dollars? Well, for 8%, this means the annual payment is $80. This means that if for one year the total interest is $80, for half a year it's going to be $40. So, coupon, well, I have to clarify, semi-annual coupon, coupon for six months is $40, okay? And if it's $40, this means that because now three months have already passed, the accrued interest for the last three months, meaning since the last payment, is half, $20. $20. So $20 is already accrued, and $20 left to earn. So, the first three months are going to earn 20, and the next three months are going to earn 20. Well, if I already buy one or two, it doesn't matter, 10 years ago the bond, for the last three months I am holding the bond. Because the total coupon is 40, I have already earned and I'm entitled to 20. So, we should add to the price of the bond the interest which I have already earned. Well, that interest which has been earned but not yet paid is accrued interest. In this particular example, the accrued interest which I just designed for you is $20. So, I can give you a very simple question on the next exam and it's going to be something like, well, the annual interest is 12% and it's been uh, four months since the last coupon payment. How much is the accrued interest? And if it's 12%, this means that the accrued interest for four months is $40. All right? It is, again, very simple. If it's 12%, $120 is the total interest for 12 months. So monthly, you have $10 accrued for one month. 
If you have two months since last payments, you're going to have $20 accrued. If you have three months since last payments, you're going to have $30 accrued. If you have five months since last payments, you're going to have $50. All right? Is that fair to you? Okay, that's accrued interest and basic calculation. And we have the last two concept is that of full price and clean price. Full price is also known as dirty price. Uh, both full and clean price, page 32. So, what is full price? Full price is quoted bond price including accrued interest. So, this is the bond price with accrued interest included. And the clean price is the price which does not include the accrued interest. Now, why is that going to be? Well, you don't want every day to quote new price, adding every day the interest for that particular day. And sometimes there's going to be another problem. Sometimes the bond's going to be issued and paying on July 1. But that is going to be paying on July 5, that is going to be paying on September 1. So all you want to see is basically the clean price. And a clean price is going to give you basically the pure interest that you're going to be getting. And you're going to, on the day of the purchase, actually on the day of the settlement, you're going to separately calculate the accrued interest and you're going to add it separately to get the full price. So usually, Quotations are preferred to use the clean price. Okay, let's provide an example with okay Taiwan government bonds. Well, you got a ten-year Taiwan government bonds, but you got a few of them. You know, one was issued you know uh, seven months ago, another one was issued three months ago, another one was issued one month ago, and all of these have exactly the same risk and almost the same maturity. And you're just going to say, oh, the yield on these is going to be 2.7%, okay? And when you say that that's the yield, you're not going to worry about the accrued interest. You're going to worry about accrued interest once you say, oh, I want to get the December bond, the bond maturing in December, only then you're going to add separately the accrued interest. Otherwise, what can happen is if the government issues every month, you don't want to have three different prices for the bond, for three different bonds, which are just one month apart. You're going to get only one price, and you're separately going to be calculating the accrued interest. It's good enough for now, right? Uh, chapter finish, uh, lecture finish. 10 minutes, we'll continue next chapter.